And welcome, Hoosier fans, to another episode of Podcast on the Brink, your weekly dose of Indiana University basketball news and discussion. I'm your host, Jared Morris. Podcast on the Brink is a joint production of the Assembly Call and Inside the Hall. For complete coverage of IU basketball, visit assemblycall.com and insidethehall.com. It's time for Indiana basketball. Tickets for many series games are now available online at iuhoosiers.com or by calling 866-IU-SPORTS. Many series tickets are available in six-game or three-game ticket packages as well as individual games, so you'll have plenty of chances to catch the Hoosiers in action at Simon Scott Assembly Hall this season. Grab your tickets online at iuhoosiers.com or get them by phone by calling 866-IU-SPORTS. Go IU! On this week's edition of Podcast on the Brink, we talk with Rick Bozich of WDRB in Louisville about what has gone wrong over these first two games for the Indiana Hoosiers. Uh, Rick was there at the press conference after the Indiana State game where Archie Miller called his guys soft. We dive into that a little bit. Uh, We also (laughs) do address a few positives, some things that are working for Indiana, but more importantly, what is going to have to change, what needs to evolve for this team for them to put these uh, poor performances in the rear view and really start to improve and make something of this season. And, of course, we talk a little bit about Romeo Langford as well. All of that and more coming up on this week's edition of Podcast on the Brink. Like most sports fans, you've probably found that buying tickets to sports and concerts, too, can be a complicated process. But here's the thing. There is a better, simpler way to buy And that is with SeatGeek. SeatGeek is the smartest, easiest way to get tickets to live events because with SeatGeek's seamless mobile experience, you can actually buy or even sell tickets in just two taps. SeatGeek helps you find the best seats at the best prices, fully guaranteed. And there is nothing quite like seeing your favorite team or musician in person, and SeatGeek will help you get closer to the action for a great value. In fact, SeatGeek helped me get closer to the action last season when I saw Yogi play here in Dallas. I'll probably go see him again this year. Uh, and same thing for my wife this offseason. I got her concert tickets as a gift, and she really enjoyed it. And we did it all with SeatGeek because SeatGeek is designed to make the ticket buying experience easier than ever. They save you time and money by searching multiple ticket sites to compare prices and find you amazing deals. Now, here is what you should do next, because best of all, Podcast on the Brink listeners actually get $20 off of your first SeatGeek purchase, so there's that little bonus. All you have to do is download the SeatGeek app and enter the promo code BRINK today. That's promo code BRINK, B-R-I-N-K, for $20 off your first SeatGeek purchase. And we are joined on this episode of Podcast on the Brink by the great Rick Bozich from WDRB in Louisville. Rick, always great to have you on the show. Welcome. Thanks for having me. Happy basketball season. Yes. Uh, Hasn't been the greatest start so far for Indiana, but there's 28 or 30 games to go, so we'll see how it happens. Yeah, I mean, you know, the start of basketball season is always happy for IU fans, but you don't necessarily expect to start out getting drubbed at home by Indiana State and then kind of escaping against Howard. How do you kind of make sense of these first two performances by the Hoosiers? That is a great question, and I wish I had an answer for it. Um, I was there Friday night and watched it go from, I don't know, 16 to 5 to 26 to 11 to 54 to whatever it was and was looking it up saying that's more points than last year's team gave up in any half all year last year and that seemed strange and then when it got 70 to 40 I just I was sitting next to Bob Hamill and looked at him and he said you know obviously it wasn't very good play from Indiana but he tended to give credit to Indiana State saying that was he had seen by a visiting team in Assembly Hall and uh, nobody's seen more games in Assembly Hall than Bob Hamill When you make 17 to 22 threes uh, and the visiting team makes 17 to 22 threes and the home team makes, what, 1 of 10 or 1 of 11 to start, you're going to look bad. And they look bad. And uh, they looked a little bit – I know a lot of people said afterwards they didn't really look engaged or excited or aggressive. Um, And maybe that was the case. But it it just opened a lot of questions uh, where people still saying, how could could they get beat like that? And it's – 
uh, a message out across the country of Indiana getting beat by 21 points in Indiana State uh, in its opening game, wondering what's going on. Oh, and obviously a big storyline coming into the season was that a lot of the national experts weren't very high on Indiana, you know, picking Indiana 10th, 11th, 11th, 12th in the conference. Where were you kind of before these first few games on what you expected from the Hoosiers? And has what you saw over the first 80 minutes of basketball forced you to adjust your expectations for this season? Um, I think I had an ace. And I think when I thought about it, I thought their ceiling was probably fifth and their floor was probably 10th. If you ask me now how I would readjust, I'd say their ceiling might be like 6th or 7th, and their floor might be 13th, 14th. I mean, if um, maybe it's an overreaction because some really strange shooting stats in both those games. Uh, like I said, the three-point shooting by Indiana State and then Indiana going 12 for 29 and free throws the second game. And at the end of the Howard game, they threw up three ridiculous threes in a row and they all went in and, and even Archie Miller said when you give up 33 point 33 point shots in the first two games uh that can't continue so I I have downplayed my expectations some but I, I guess I'm gonna also wait and see what happens Thursday night when Indiana State plays Auburn um you know there's a tendency I think Indiana State only won 10 games last year but this is a different team and their guards look better better than Indiana's guards they really did Scott's a Big, strong, aggressive kid, and the other kid who made those threes, I don't remember his name, but he looked like a heck of a shooter. When you look at you know, the first couple of games, the, the thing that stands out to me the most is, is the adjustment of how Indiana played before to how they're playing now and, and how that all factors into to maybe the confidence level of this team. How, how big of an adjustment do you think it is for the players who are upperclassmen Take a Robert Johnson or Josh Newkirk. This is Josh Newkirk's third year in the program, second year playing. Robert Johnson, his fourth year. You know, the first couple of years for Newkirk and the first three years for Johnson were under a completely different system. And now they're being asked to do something completely different. How hard of an adjustment do you think that is for these players to just kind of scrape what they've learned or scrap what they've learned, you know, for the last couple of years and do something that, that's really in terms of style of play. I mean, this is a complete departure from what Indiana used to do under Tom Crean. Yeah, I think it's major. Um, I can't gauge how much it affects them or how much they play, but you can look at it both sides of the ball. Offensively, it seemed to me that their driving philosophy was to play as fast as possible. And I think a lot of people tended to think it was even too fast, which led them to a lot of the careless turnovers they had. But even down to the minute detail of after a made basket by the other team, if you would watch them take the ball out of bounds, they would do it with one foot across the end line and one foot in bounds to help. Like, I don't know if it really did make them play quicker or, or it looked, made them look like they were playing quicker or whatever, but that was their whole thing, attack, attack, attack. And it's not that way now. I mean, they're not they're playing fast, but they're not playing – Hyperspeed defensively, uh, it's a big adjustment too because they're playing a different style. Uh, I could definitely tell from the first game, and I know it didn't show up in the shooting stats. They were doing a much different job of uh, defending the pick and roll. It was the hedging on the screens was longer and harder, and it worked early on. Um, and the pack line defense is different, where you're the whole philosophy is to take away dribble penetration and, and be exposed a little bit on the wings and they were exposed on the wings and, and got beat, but it's a whole different, a different approach both ways. And, and thirdly, I mean, it's a new voice. Um, Tom Crean's way of coaching and personality different than Archie Miller. And I think it takes guys time to adjust what it's like to be coached by this guy. I don't know how he reacted after the loss, whether he's hard on them or, or whatever. But I think the whole thing is a big, big adjustment. And I don't really think it's that coincidental that two of the guys that have played better are Justin Smith and Al Durham because they're only guys who've played for Archie. The the thing that was most telling to me in the, in the Friday press conference, and I think a lot of us that were in that room, you were there, obviously I was there, was, you know, we were just kind of, I think, shocked in a lot of ways of what we just saw. But you asked, a, I thought, a pretty good follow-up question to Archie after he used the word soft, and then you kind of asked him what that meant. Can you maybe just expand a little bit on, you know, that that's kind of a buzzword maybe that's thrown around a little bit. In terms of this team, what you've seen so far, 
in what ways do you think that, that they're softer uh, than what Archie Miller would like? I think it means almost 100% soft mentally. It means not being the aggressor, not being assertive, not playing with a little bit of an edge. Um, I think he thought once they got behind against Indiana State, they got discouraged. And, you know, then instead of really kind of like fighting back once it got to 10, you know, you really, when it gets to 10 or 15 or whatever, and it's mid to late in the first half, most teams set a goal, get it to single figures by the end of the half, and this got to 20. And so it's like digging in and saying we're going to get, you know, two, three, four, five stops in a row and then come down and score. And I think he was discouraged that his team never found a way to sort of stop the bleeding. And I think it was you, Jared, that had the stat that, you know, they got outscored, I think, in the first half during every TV timeout segment. And that's yep. that's not showing any toughness. That's just, you know, that's – that was Indiana State took it to him, and they never, you know, counterpunched. And that's what I think made him. I thought he was in control in the press conference, but I think you could tell he was steaming. <laughs> Some of those facial expressions were, uh, <laughs> you know, I mean, it was, you know, it's it's been nice, I guess, watching and listening to his press conferences because I mean, he's not going to give you everything, obviously, but no. Do do you get the feeling? I mean, actually being there, I, I know it's kind of hard sometimes just watching on video, but. I mean, do you get the feeling that he's, you know, just being, you know, pretty candid with how he feels and, and, and where he is with his team at any moment when he's in there talking to you guys? Oh, yeah. He's very candid. He's not trying to tell one-liners. He's not telling anecdotes. He's not, like, slapping his knee and, you know, trying to entertain you. He gives you a straight answer to the question, and um, that was really more throwing guys under the bus than Tom Crean did. I'd say the whole time he was at IU. I mean, to call your players soft the very first game, that's, if I was a player, that's one of the worst things a coach could say about me, to say that, you, well, you think I'm soft, and I don't know whether how much of it he really believed or how much he was trying to motivate the guys, but I thought it was a coach, especially when, and I remember Archie when he played at NC State, that would be the last thing you would call him because he was an undersized guy who had to scrap for everything he got in the ACC, and he's playing in one of the toughest leagues in the country, in that area against Duke and NC State, and anything he gets, he's going to have to scrap for. And I think he looked at his, his players and said, you guys didn't scrap for anything. Do you think to a certain extent that, 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 that there's an inevitability of, you know, kind of a coach and maybe holdover players butting heads like that, or maybe a coach not necessarily, you know, kind of buying into the mentality of some of these players because they're not guys that he recruited, and they were guys who recruited to play another system. And you know, I, I wonder if maybe as fans we underestimated a little bit just how difficult, not just the transition kind of on the court with the system, but even just the transition in terms of mentality for what he expects and what was expected of them before. Uh, did we underrate maybe how difficult that will be with a new coach taking over guys that he didn't recruit? Um, yeah, I think so. I mean, I, what's interesting to me is, I mean, his comments about the players and how hard they worked were uniformly pretty positive after he took over and during the summer and into the fall training camp and the players have been pretty, and you felt like everybody was on a good vibe. But I think what happens is that, you know, before when these guys played and had defensive breakdowns and had breakdowns on turnovers, there would be talk about it after the game and they would say, yeah, we're going to change. We're going to work on that and guys have to do it. But I don't, it was my sense. There wasn't enough accountability of like, if you're going to keep doing this, you're going to sit. And I think it's like, there's a new sheriff in town. It's like, okay, if you're going to keep doing this, we're going to try something different. And I think that's one thing that they may have to adjust to, because I think before the turnovers and the problems, you know, staying in front of your man were identified and admitted to, but nothing was ever, nothing was done to consistently change it. And I think Archie's going to try to find a way and say, hey, this, this can't go on this way. All right, we have more coming here with Rick Bozich on Podcast on the Brink. Uh, I do want to hop in here and tell you real quick about our new sponsor, Hoosier Proud, who we are so excited to have as part of Podcast on the Brink this year. And Hoosier Proud is, of course, an Indiana-based T-shirt and apparel company that is by Hoosiers for Hoosiers. And if you have been to their website, HoosierProud.com, then you know why they're so special and why their shirts are popping up all over the state and beyond. 
But if you haven't been to HoosierProud.com yet, then let me give you a few reasons why you should check them out. And number one is those designs. They have officially licensed IU gear now, as well as a bunch of really cool and interesting Indiana-inspired designs, and now official inside-the-hall gear as well. All of that available at HoosierProud.com. Uh, the second reason to go is their philanthropy. Hoosier Proud donates a portion of the revenue from their t-shirt sales to specific Indiana-based charities. And on their website, you can see what charities they support. And the third reason to visit HoosierProud.com is their generosity. One of the reasons why we love working with Connor and the crew at Hoosier Proud, uh, both here on Inside the Hall and at Assembly Call, is they're very generous with our listeners. And because you are a listener to Podcast on the Brink, you get a 15% discount on everything that you order at HoosierProud.com. All you have to do is use the promo code BRINK, B-R-I-N-K, and you will get 15% off of your entire order. Again, that is promo code BRINK, B-R-I-N-K. Check them out at HoosierProud.com. Now that we've kind of gone through most a lot of the negative things from the first two games, I'm curious your thoughts um, on the first two games in terms of positive things. I mean, there's obviously been Al Durham played really well against Howard. Uh, Duran Davis, I feel like, has has shown that, that he's going to be a, a capable guy of scoring in the post. And, and when you look back at the first two games, what are the positives uh, that, that you can take from, from those two contests? Yeah, I mean, the first one is Davis. I mean, he is, I think, who a lot of people thought he was. He's a big, wide, strong body who's got good hands and good footwork. He's got some up and under moves. He's got a reverse pivot. He can use the glass. He can, you know, spin underneath the rim and, and you know, score from one side of the block to the other. Uh, and he stayed out of fouls. Right? He didn't get any fouls. I think he had zero fouls against Howard and stayed on the floor longer. Um, and he looks like he's in better condition. So um, I thought he was by far and away the number one plus. Second, I would say, would be Durham and Smith combined um, when we heard – Archie Miller talk about Al Durham and said he thought he was a good shooter. I think a lot of us who'd watched him play uh, some in high school and then at the Derby Classic weren't really convinced that was the case. But um, he hit three threes the other night, and I know he missed a few free throws. But he's you know he's a long, athletic guy who looked like he was competitive, and he's going to have ups and downs because he's a freshman. And but I mean, he looks like he's a guy who will be able to contribute and be a very functional, solid player for four years. And Justin Smith, super athletic, uh, nose for the glass, did a great job of getting in the middle of the zone defense and uh, at the top of the key and, and throwing the ball off. Didn't try and do too many things that he shouldn't try and do. Uh, had a few too many turnovers, but another good piece. Those would, would be the three main ones. Uh, uh, you know, the disappointing ones would be I know Morgan only played five minutes against Howard, but he didn't really have any impact on the game Friday night. That would be a disappointing one. And um, and Robert Johnson played better against Howard, but he's a senior guard who's played a ton of big games for Indiana through the years. And um, he just, I don't know, he, he needs, need, I, I, he's never going to really be a big emotional leader, but um, they need him to sort of play with more of, of an edge and, and, and put more of his, you know, stamp on the game. Yeah, the two guys I'm looking at right now, just based on the evidence I've seen through the two exhibition games and obviously the hysteria scrimmage and then the two regular season games that need to play better. Uh, you mentioned Robert Johnson. The other one's Josh Newkirk. And to me, his body language over the first two games, he just doesn't look like he's completely comfortable. I, I think in a lot of ways he um, – as a guy that, that likes to push the pace, was obviously more well suited to to play in the previous uh, system. What 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 do you think his role is going to be the rest of the way? Is this going to be a situation where if he doesn't adjust uh, to what you know this new coaching staff wants out of him, where he could see himself losing a lot of minutes to Devonte Green and Al Durham, or, or what, what do you feel like the role is? Because he's a senior, and if this gets to the point where you know Indiana's not going to make the postseason, or this is a team that's, that really wants to go young, he, he to me looks like a guy who could find himself on the outside looking in in terms of minutes. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, Archie Miller was pretty positive still about him after the game Sunday night, saying he, you know, he thought he took some good shots. They just didn't go in. And he did have 
mean, the one that went in rattled in and out, but he had a couple other ones that rattled in and out. So if he makes two and goes three from seven from three, it changes the whole storyline about him. When you don't shoot well, people tend to, you know, they, they cling to that one for seven and say, why is he jacking up all those shots? Um, but I agree with you. He seems to be a guy who's better suited to, to get up and down the floor. Although, you know, they played more up and down the floor last year and he had a, he finished strong, but he didn't have a great year overall. So I don't know. I mean, I think it's going to be a lot of mixing and matching for quite a while until he finds, you know, the two or three guys that he's most comfortable with who can a defend B set other people up and, and C score some. So, um, I, I think it's too soon to write anybody off. And I think it's these guys, every game is sort of an audition to say, I, 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 I want to see who's going to play the way I want you to play. And they're going to have a, I mean, the game tomorrow night is a huge, huge, uh, challenge because Seton Hall is a veteran team. Uh, they got tough kids. Kevin Willard's the coach who came up under Rick Pitino. So they're going to play really aggressive, take it to it, you know, slap down on the ball defense. And if Indiana comes goes in there and uh, doesn't like push back or, or, or try and be the aggressor, uh, they're going to have big issues because I, I think Seton Hall uh, is pretty good. You know, and and one element of feeling comfortable being an aggressor on the road is kind of having an identity and having some things that you do that you really believe mm-hmm. in. And, and it's clear that this team is struggling with that, and that's not altogether surprising given the coaching change and the new system. It kind of feels like the one thing that this team feels confident in, you know, as you watch the second half of the Howard game unfold and things got, you know, I mean, the Howard got made it a little bit too close for comfort. When Indiana needed to score, they went into Duran, you know, and he played very well in the second right. half. So that seems like maybe the one thing they feel comfortable in right now as you kind of look forward in the season what do you think could be the first thing that emerges as kind of a team-wide identity or something they can really hang their hat on do you think it'll come on the offensive end you know for guys who have clearly been more comfortable playing offense through their careers at least the veterans or do you think Archie is going to be able to really instill at least some of the principles he wants defensively to where that's something this team can hang its hat on uh, I would think it'd be more of the latter defensively. Um, when, I, when I look at them offensively, the one thing that I see that I think is a big issue for them is uh, they don't really have one guy in, in, in the three primary positions that control the ball, which are the both guard spots and the wing, a guy who can just take the ball and you know go get a basket or go make a play or go draw a double team, beat their guy off the dribble. I mean, Robert Johnson's not that kind of guy. Newkirk really isn't that kind of guy. Devontae Green can be, but, you know, he's not done it consistently. And at small forward, you know, I guess maybe at some point Justin Smith would be that guy. But I mean, like creating his own shot and driving and taking 15 footers, that's not really his game either. So uh, to me, the identity will have to be built first on defense uh, because that's where it's most like they're more likely to be successful, in my opinion. And it's more likely uh, that that's what Archie's going to focus on. They, they, that to me, that's the big flaw with this team is they don't they don't have a Yogi Ferrell, they don't have a, uh, a Troy Williams, they don't have a Victor Oladipo. Those guys, when they had the ball, you always felt like, you know, if it's late in the shot clock or the play broke down, they could just beat their man and make a play. I don't see a guy like that in this team. Do you? No. No, I mean, I, we've, I think we've all been waiting for that guy to emerge. And again, I think a lot of people thought Devontae could be that guy after what we saw in that first exhibition game. And like you said, at times he can, but he just still hasn't shaken his inconsistency, not just game to game, but sometimes minute to minute within a game. And for him to be that guy, he's going to obviously have to you know, get a lot better and more consistent at doing that. Yeah, and he's still doing the thing that I think a lot of young players, there's two things young players I think have to learn is one, Make the simple play instead of the fancy or complicated play. And B, don't take contested shots. And C, I mean, really don't take even semi-contested shots early in the shot clock. You can do that in high school because, you know, you're that much more physically gifted than the guys you're playing against. But, you know, it's all a thing that I think Archie Miller's trying to teach these guys is that, you know, possessions are valuable. And if you come down and – um take a contested shot or take a, a shot after one pass early in the shot clock. That really isn't a great shot. Not from a place that, you know, the coaching staff is comfortable with a guy shooting from that, that can't happen. And I, I think Mil- green's the one, guy, I think green is one guy that needs to learn that lesson. He's so confident in his offensive skills that he thinks he can make those shots. 
but you know he he's not to the point yet where I think that he's ha- should have the uh, the green light to do it. Obviously, yesterday disappointing news uh, to, to to some Indiana fans that Darius Garland picking Vanderbilt, but. I, th- I think most of the attention, obviously, is is focused on Romeo Langford, and you know the interesting perspective that that both of us have on on Romeo Langford is uh, obviously uh, I grew up in New Albany, uh, we lived in New Albany for a long time, saw a lot of great players come through there, went to New Albany games growing up, and um, I don't think Southern Indiana has seen anything like Romeo Langford before, you know. As someone who covers sports in the Louisville market, Southern Indiana has been around for a long time. Is this the most talented player that has come through uh, here since you've been around? Is there a comparable guy that you can remember uh, that's getting the kind of the hype and the and the buzz that Romeo is getting? Uh, one guy that I can think was better was Alan Houston. Uh, Alan Houston at Ballard was just a terrific player. Uh, and then he went on, you know, he was an NBA all-star and played for the Knicks for all those years and um, scored a ton of points in the NBA and didn't really get enough acclaim in college because he played for his dad at Tennessee and they didn't really do that well. But I would say Alan Houston um, would be the main one. Um, but, yeah, I mean, Romeo Langford started hearing about him. Robbie Valentine, who played at Louisville, told me about him when he was in the eighth grade at Scribner, and I thought, you know, another one of these guys that you hear about when they're in eighth grade wonder how, how good can he really be. And then as his freshman year, he started doing all these incredible things. And, you know, he's legit. He's proven he's legit. And I, I don't think he's going to overtake Damon Bailey as the all-time leading scorer in Indiana, but he's going to end up second or third most likely. And, um, you know, he's he's a special guy. If you live in the southern Indiana, Louisville area, I'd say make a point to go out and see him play sometime because uh, he'll be worth the investment of your, your hour and a half for a high school basketball game. You know, they've obviously played uh, th- that that recruitment pretty close to the vest, um, and obviously he's now down mm-hmm. to three, and Indiana's one of the final three. How, you know, and I think some people started panicking after these first two games, like, well, shoot, Romeo's not going to want to come here now. You know, we're, we're, you know, we're losing Indiana State and blah, blah, blah. How much do you think it, it will impact that decision, how well Indiana does this year on the court? Um, for, for a guy like Romeo, who is expected to just play one year and certainly wants to obviously make that one year a, a good one in terms of on-court success. Yeah, um, if that's going to be the telltale factor, then he's going to go to Kansas uh, because Vandy's not going to be any national contender next year. I think Vanderbilt lost on Monday night to Belmont, didn't they? Uh, so they didn't have a great start to their season either. Uh, I think if he would go to Vanderbilt, it would be because maybe of a friendship with Darius Garland. But it's hard to say. I mean, Mr. Langford, Tim Langford, has played this very close to the vest. I think he's done a tremendous job of staying in control of the situation and not let it get crazy uh, with, you know, all these interviews and, you know, hysteria that um, – comes around recruiting he's tried to keep his son have as much of a normal experience as he can but i can't speak i don't know him well enough to speak for him it's like that you can look at it two ways you can say well they're not going to be a national contender so he's not going to go there or you could say well they got a good freshman class coming in and he's really going to get a chance to they need him he's got a chance to go in there and and really shine so that appeals to him so if you're if it's going to be a decision made on who's going to have the best team it's going to be Kansas, uh, in my opinion, because they win the Big 12 every year. They're usually a high seed in the NCAA tournament. They've already got, I think, three commitments from top 100 guys. So if that's the deciding factor, I'd say Kansas would be the one to worry about. You're an AP top 25 voter. Um, I think you've done it now for several consecutive years. You know that we're we're a week into the season. Anything standing out from a national perspective? I thought Wichita State's win last night was really impressive. I think they're a team that that you know nationally is being maybe overlooked a little bit, like as they are every year. Uh, obviously, there's the Champions Classic tonight where we're going to get a chance to see I think four of the top five teams playing an event. Anything from a national perspective? You know, we're just a little less than a week into the season now, but anything standing out to you? Um, I agree with you on Wichita. I would have voted. I think I voted in fifth or sixth. I would have had him even higher, but they had, you know, Landry Shamet was got a foot injury, and I don't know if he's even playing yet or not. But they got a, and Marcus McDuffie, another one of their guys, has been hurt, so they're not totally healthy. But I saw them play last year up in 
Indy when they beat Archie Miller and Dayton, and then they took Kentucky to the wire and got all five starters back. Marshall's a heck of a coach. I think they're they're deserving of of their hype. And early on, I mean, freshmen are playing really well. I looked at you know Marvin Bagley, who will be down in Bloomington in two weeks. Uh, what's he had 49 points in two games, and people are, are raving about how good he is. I think he's better than the average Duke, more like a, a, a Parker or an Okafor than a Giles in terms of a freshman there. Um, kid DeAndre Ayton at uh, Arizona's had two strong games, but you know it's early, and I, I try and. Remember that in wasn't that long ago uh, that the season didn't even start till December the first. You know we're not even, we're not even at November fifteenth, so I try not to make too many uh, overreactions as to what I to what I've seen. Last question for you, Rick. You know you mentioned how difficult a challenge Indiana has up against Seton Hall on Wednesday evening, and that challenge is going to be made even more difficult if Colin Hartman and Juwan Morgan can't play because not only are they two of Indiana's better players, they're two of Indiana's more experienced players, and that kind of leadership is really needed on the road. So it's going to be a tall order for Indiana to win, but I think there are ways for it to be a successful night for Indiana, even if they don't win. What are maybe the one or two things that you're going to look at that, you know, if Indiana can really do in this game, win or lose, you'll say, okay, this was something that they can kind of build on. Well, I mean, just watch them in terms of how hard they compete. Uh, you better compete on the glass because Seton Hall is going to the glass. I think Delgado's, what is he, like, they have 27 double-doubles last year. I mean, he's, he's a stud on the glass. And so whoever is on him better compete on the glass and, and just, you know, defending, are you going to defend with purpose? Are you going to defend, you know, with, with a little bit more uh, intensity of, of actually locking guys down and stringing together stops? Those would be the things uh, that you'd want to see where they go in there and play as if they intend to win instead of playing like, you know, being afraid of, of getting blown out because I, Maybe I'm higher on Seton Hall than most people, but because they got older guys, they got East Coast guys. Um, I think they're they're really sort of an aggressive, assertive team. And if they don't go in there and play with a bit of an edge, they're gonna they're gonna get hit in the mouth, and they better respond. Yeah, yeah. We'll see if they can do anything to shed that soft label that their coach put on them after that first game. Well, after uh, after six months of smooth sailing, we finally hit the first uh, choppy waters of the Archie Miller era. So <laughs> thanks for thanks for being here, Rick, to try and help us make sense of it. <laughs> you know, it's, I went back and looked at – you guys can check it out in the media guy. I went back and looked at Bob Knight's first season, and he won his first game against Ball State. But I believe before they got into conference play, he lost double figures to Ohio University, and he lost to Northern Illinois. So, I mean, it happens. And he was a guy – who transformed Indiana from the Hurry and Hoosiers to more of a defensive style. So I, I think it takes time to a break habits, and it also takes time to get the message to guys that no, it's going to be this way, not that way. And I think you noted that you know when, when sometimes when things went bad, you saw guys um, you know revert to old habits, and and that's going to take time to change some of that stuff because for some of these guys, it's been three or two or three years, and those are pretty strong habits. Yep. Well, hopefully they can start that Wednesday night and uh, give themselves a chance up there. Thanks, Rick. We really appreciate your time. Thank you. Appreciate it. All right. Thanks, guys. Thank you for listening to this episode of Podcast on the Brink. We always appreciate you being here. To get more from me and from Alex, visit assemblycall.com and insidethehall.com for complete coverage of Indiana University basketball. If you liked this episode, please consider sharing it with a friend or family member who loves IU basketball as much as you do. You can also support the show by leaving a rating and review on iTunes, which helps us get the word out to more IU fans like yourself. We will be back next week with a new episode. Until then, as always, go Hoosiers.